here we come to the time of worship. Uh, am, I, am I there? I think I'm there now. Okay. Uh, we come to the time of preaching God's Word. We come to the text of Scripture, and we are in the book of Genesis. We have been for a little while, and uh, we are in Genesis chapter 31. I encourage you to have your Bibles open in front of you following along, and uh, the version that I'm reading from will be on the screen behind me as well for your, for your benefit. But um, I encourage you to, to open your Bibles and see what God's Word says. Uh, so let's, let's begin with a word of prayer, though. <laughs> let's ask for God's help. Uh, Lord God, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for the privilege of being called your servant. Lord, your word is so rich, so life-giving, so necessary. I pray that you would draw our hearts to trust you. Lord, I pray that you would draw our hearts to respond in obedience and faithfulness to you. And may we see you more clearly today because of your word, because of your spirit ministering your word to our hearts and minds. Be glorified, I pray. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our title today is Strained Family Relations. And honestly, I don't think that needs a whole lot of introduction. I suspect most of us have experienced strained family relations at a certain level or another. And in fact, as we call ourselves a church family from time to time, there are strained relationships within a church family. Now, having strain doesn't mean that things are completely wrong or that something needs to be, you know, complete, like a relationship has to be completely wiped out. But it's what we do in these moments of strain and difficulty that determines how our family goes forward. So our, our text, let's dive right in. Genesis chapter 31, uh, chapter 31, verse 1, which says, now Jacob, by the way, I guess I should remind you that in Genesis, we're going through lately the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the fathers of the people of Israel, God's chosen people through whom he sends his son Jesus, uh, as we see in the New Testament played out, and, and the one who has provided salvation for us, salvation through Christ, through faith in Christ. What a, yeah, what a wonderful thing. And, and so Jacob is the third of the three patriarchs, and, and the text now, the author of Genesis has taken us into a little deeper look at Jacob's journey of how he walked with God, how he came to faith in God and grew in his faith in God. And so that Jacob is who we're talking about. Now Jacob heard what Laban's sons were saying. Jacob had taken, Jacob has taken all that was our father's and has built this wealth from what belonged to our father. And Jacob saw from Laban's face that his attitude, Laban's attitude toward him, towards Jacob, was not the same as before. Verse 3 tells us, the Lord said to him, go back to the land of your ancestors and to your family and I will be with you. So right off the bat, we see a situation developing. And if you recall, Jacob is, has worked for Laban now for 20 years years, seven of which to, to marry Rachel, but he didn't get Rachel, he got Leah. And so a week later, uh, he commits another seven years so he can marry Rachel. So he has two wives, Rachel and Leah, one certainly very loved, the other very unloved. And in the last couple of chapters, we've seen the, the story take place of how the family grows. Uh, two new wives are added, the, the handmaids, the servants of Leah and Rachel, he added his wives, sons are born, there are now 11 sons born, one daughter that the text reveals to us. So Jacob is in this place, he's worked for him now another six years beyond the 14 years for marrying those women to, to earn some wages. And, and Laban recognizing that he's been blessed by God because of Jacob, he wants Jacob to stay. And so he makes an agreement with Jacob that he immediately reneges on. Immediately cheats Jacob out of what had been agreed upon that he himself did not have to agree to, but did. And now in chapter 31, verse 1, the very first thing that we see take place is Laban's sons are speaking something that is not true. Oh, let's put ourselves for a second in Laban's son's shoes. They are witnessing Jacob who came to their dad, a, a you know, family relative who has come there and now married both of his sisters. And, um, 
or their sisters, I should say, multiple sons are mentioned here. So the sisters have been married to this guy. He's been there, and he, you can tell, man, he is growing in wealth. Things are going and just blowing up for Jacob, and he's having all these kids, and God seems to be blessing him. And maybe Laban's maybe a little bit less or something. Something happens that they heard something that wasn't true. They began to believe something that wasn't true. Have you ever believed something about someone? that turned out to not be true. But when you believed it, you were 100% convinced that it was true. Let's pause for a second, put ourselves in Jacob's shoes. Have you ever had someone believe something about you that isn't true? I wonder how Jacob was feeling and, he, and then noticing and maybe from that perspective that what's being said about me is untrue. And, and as he looks at his uncle, who is his father-in-law, he goes, his face has changed. His, his looking at me, uh-oh, things are going south quick. So it doesn't tell us he came up with an idea. It tells us in verse 3 that the Lord told him, it's time. Go home. Go to your family. Go, and I will be with you. So the first of our five points, I'm going to try to work through these fairly quickly. It's a long text today. But the first is this. In a family, misunderstandings are easy and abundant. It's strange to me how that can be, but it happens. And when we are quick to judge by what we perceive, we are often inaccurate or incorrect. Not always 100% incorrect. That's what's kind of funny because there's always some truth in a lie or usually some truth in a lie or some untruth in a truth. When it comes to family relations especially, we're, we, we find, at least I find, in humans we tend to be a little less gracious it's been a struggle. It's like my, my guard goes down in my own household, and I don't put on the same outward bounds of concern about what people think about me, and, and so it's easier to be a little bit quick-tempered, where maybe in another place you wouldn't be, because you could lose your job, because people would think badly of you. But in your family, it's like we just, we drop some of those barriers, and we are less gracious with our own family sometimes. We struggle sometimes having a willingness to see that those who we believe poorly about our goodwill towards us. And so then when we begin to stop believing that they are goodwill towards us, we start seeing the things that they do from a different perspective and we start reading heart motive that we are not capable of judging as humans. And we tend to be unwilling to give the benefit of the unknown. There's, there's a lot of things we don't know. There's a lot of things that we cannot understand of someone else's motive and intention. And here, this is Jacob. He's experiencing this difficulty, this misunderstanding, this untruth that is being talked about about him. And here he is in a difficult place. When we misunderstand something, we often make something that should have been a small thing, we let it be a big thing. We turn a molehill into a mountain, if you will. And here, this idea that Jacob was stealing from Laban, Laban is really ridiculous. Uh, they're thinking that this is going to bring harm to Laban's wealth. But if we recall, Laban himself admitted his wealth was because of the blessing of God on Jacob's life in his household. It, it's almost the opposite of what they were saying. But because they believed it, Jacob then becomes a threat to these sons because they began to feel threatened that Jacob is going to take our inheritance. And... The New Testament reminds us that the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. So if their money, their future for having wealth is now being threatened by this guy, you can see why it would turn kind of into animosity. Jacob became a threat. In this, we find a difficult situation. But what's amazing is that in the situation, I'll reiterate this, each person in the story thought that they understood what the truth was. They thought they knew it. And the story continues in verse 4. So Jacob had Rachel and Leah called to the field where his flocks were. He said to them, I can see from your father's face that his attitude toward me is not the same as before. But the God of my father has been with me. And you know that with all my strength I have served your father. And that he has cheated me. And changed my wages ten times. But God has not let him harm me. If he said the spotted sheep will be your wages, then all the sheep were born spotted. 
Wow. If he said the streaked sheep will be your wages, then all the sheep were born streaked. Implying that if Laban changed the deal to, to give him less, then God changed the deal and, and, or, or honored the deal and made more spotted sheep or more streaked sheep to bless Jacob as he had promised he would. And then Jacob gives God credit in verse 9 saying, God has taken away your father's herds and given them to me. So we see Jacob having kind of a family meeting here with his wives. And he reminds them, your father's cheated me, changed my wages 10 times, but I did serve your father with all my strength. I haven't wronged him, is what he's saying. And in spite of all that, God has not let him harm me. And according to Jacob, he, re he recognizes that it is the hand of God, the work of God that has blessed him to the point that he is, even if that meant taking from Laban and giving to him, though I think Laban is still far better shaped than he was before Jacob showed up. But Jacob continues in his conversation with his wives in verse 10 saying, when the flocks were breeding, I saw in a dream that the street spotted and speckled males were mating with the females. In that dream, the angel of God said to me, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, look up and see all the males that are mating with the flocks are streaked, spotted and speckled for I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel. That's the place that God encountered him. And in case Jacob didn't remember, he adds that. I'm the God of Bethel, where you poured oil on the stone marker, and you made a solemn vow to me. For me to be your God is what he does, declaring a vow on that journey, on his refuge uh, flight from his household where Esau wanted to kill him to go to his uncle Laban. And in the dream, he's, he's continuing to tell us what the angel of the Lord spoke to him in the dream in the final sentence, get up. Leave this land and return to your native land. So this same God who Jacob met at Bethel and God became his God in that place is now speaking to him and saying, it's time, get up, leave, go to your, go to your family, go to your native land. And what an interesting thing for him to say native land because if you recall, Abraham came from where he's at now. That's why the family is still there for him to go back to. So in a lot of ways, we would have described that as his native land. But God, having given the land promised to Abraham and Isaac and also now to Jacob, he's saying the native land is actually the land of Canaan, the promised land. So Jacob speaks these things to his wife, credits God with the direction and the instruction to leave. And then we see Rachel and Leah respond in verse 14. Then Rachel and Leah answered him, do we have any portion or inheritance in our father's family? The implied answer is no. Whatever you have as our inheritance, it's, it's not going to be more from dad. Verse 15, they continued, are we not regarded by him as outsiders? So the daughters feel pretty separated from Laban, their dad, for whatever reason. And for, it says, for he has sold us. They recognized that they were kind of a bargain piece of property. He has sold us and has certainly spent our purchase price. So what Jacob gave to Laban, what Jacob earned for Laban in order to exchange the, the wife relationship situation, he's like, they're like, he didn't even save that to help us out. Now, I mentioned misunderstandings. Do we know for a fact that that's the truth or simply that that's their perception? All we know is it's their perception. The author is simply telling us what they said. Verse 16, they continue, In fact, all the wealth that God has taken away from our Father belongs to us and to our children. So do whatever God has said to you. Do you realize who's speaking and all of a sudden in agreement here? Rachel and Leah. They're in unity with their husband Jacob. Now, if you recall the last chapter, there was not a lot of family unity going on with Rachel and Leah. They, they were not in agreement. They were not in unity. But now, with a common problem, they come together and actually are in agreement. It's really quite remarkable. And so, we get to point number two this morning, that in a family, unity is possible even with imperfect relationships. Or relations. We saw that in the last chapter, the rivalry these sisters had in competing for their husband's attention 
for his honor, for, uh, to be honored in the household, and for intimacy with their husband. Things that human women need as wives. They had not been in friendly relations with each other. There was not unity in the household, but now all of a sudden they're in agreement. So Jacob calls a family meeting and brings them to the table and they talk and they communicate. And they come together on the same page, the, the, the unity page of what they needed to do best for their family. And they united. And they followed their leader, Jacob, their husband, Jacob, who had really taken a very passive role prior to this moment in the entire family relationships. Jacob has been incredibly quiet despite all of the rivalry, despite all of the trouble and difficulty. And so I can tell you that people do unite for both right and wrong reasons. But people do unite with differences. So it's possible. Unity is possible in family relationships, even though we're imperfect and different. And why is it in our culture? And, it, and by the way, and as a history guy that loves to read history, it's not new to our culture, actually. I think times I think it's new to our culture that we are so in opposition with each other that if we don't line up, and, and there's no greater probably example than, than the political sphere. Like if you're a Republican, the Democrat is your enemy and, and they are evil incarnate. And if you're a Democrat, the Republican is your enemy and practically evil incarnate and there is no coming together on anything, right? This is, but you know what? That happened clear at the beginning of the founding of our country. Did you know that there was a, a congressman who used a cane to beat up an, another congressman who ended up grabbing a fire poker and fighting back in, in late 1700s? Okay, th there has been animosity and differences for all of human history under sin. But unity is possible. So verse 17 tells us, so Jacob got up and put his children and, and wives on the camels. He took all the livestock and possessions he had acquired in Padan Aram, and he drove his herds to, the, to go to the land of Canaan, to his father Isaac. When Laban had gone to shear his sheep, Rachel stole her father's household idols. That's an interesting insertion into the story. Take note of it. And then verse 20 continues, and Jacob deceived Laban. Ooh. He deceived Laban, the Aramean, not telling him that he was fleeing. Generally, by definition, if you're fleeing, you probably don't want to give a heads up. But was it necessary to flee? God told him to go to his family. He didn't tell him to deceive Laban to go to his family. But it does tell us that's what he did. Verse 21, he fled with all his possessions, crossed the Euphrates River, which is up near Padan Aram, and headed for the hill country of Gilead, which is kind of between the northern sea and the southern sea of the land of Canaan, and kind of to the east of the Jordan River. That, there's kind of a region there as he's headed towards where he believed his dad to be, which would have been a little further west and south, and that's where he finds him later on, we'll, we'll see. But that's, he's on his journey that direction. But it is a journey of, that began with deception, waiting till Laban was out shearing sheep so he could gather his family and his possessions and take off without anybody knowing it. That's what happens. A secretive departure occurs. I wonder how Jacob expected that to work out. I wonder if he gave thought to what Laban might do or respond he probably gave thought to what it would be like if he spoke to Laban to let him know it's time for me to leave with my family. But was he correct in his thoughts? Would he have been correct? God didn't tell him to leave in secret, to flee. He told him to go to his homeland. And then there's that odd detail of Rachel stealing her father's household idols. And I want to ask a question or maybe a few questions on that. And I don't have the answers for that right off the bat. Uh, but why? Why did Rachel steal her father's household idols. Jacob is the, a follower of Yahweh, God, a creator God of all things, the one and only God. And why did she grab her father's household idols? What benefit or purpose did she envision that serving? Was it 
Was it because she saw those idols as valuable? Maybe they were overlaid with gold or silver or some precious metal. Did she see it as an opportunity to just, just hurt her dad that when he came home and saw his household idols gone that he would be hurt and she could get some pleasure from that? I don't know. Did she believe the gods that those idols represented would help her? I don't know. But I, I, I can't find or think of an answer that would be that this was a good decision on Rachel's part, but it's still something that God used, as we see later in this chapter. So let's keep going. Verse 22, on the third day, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. So he took his relatives with him, pursued Jacob for seven days, and overtook him in the hill country of Gilead. But God came to Laban, the Aramean, in a dream at night. Watch yourself. God warned him, don't say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. What an interesting moment. Laban pursues Jacob, and, and when, you, when you look at this text, you go, There's, with what kind of intent? Was it good? No, no it doesn't look good at all. Laban planned to do harm to Jacob somehow, whether that mean take his daughters and grandchildren and his possessions and take them back to his house and, and maybe beat Jacob up and leave him. I, I don't know what all was included in Laban's mind, but he was pursuing him to do harm. And there's this but God moment. God intervenes to handle the situation as he sees fit. And he comes to Laban in a dream saying, hey, watch yourself. Don't. Don't say anything good or bad to Jacob. And don't do anything good or bad <laughs> implied. So it brings me to a third point. In a family, overreactions are common. It kind of builds from the misunderstandings are easy and abundant. And so we react to what our understanding is of truth. And we go into a mode of outrage and overreaction readily and quickly too often. Jacob fled without communication. I believe that's an overreaction. God didn't tell him to do that. That wasn't necessary. He just needed to go, but he could have communicated. Laban pursued with the intent to do harm. That's an overreaction. And unless God warned him to stop, he surely would have attempted to do harm. And since God warned him to stop, Laban was angry. And I'm going to give him some grace and go, he was partly right to be angry. If I were Laban, if I were granddad, granted, I may have done some poor things, but that's still my family. Those are my, my daughters and my grandkids, and I, I'd like to send them off well. I'm not saying that that's what he thought. I'm just saying I, I could give some grace to being a possibility that he was angry for a good reason. Like, how, how dare this young man, my son-in-law, take my daughters away without, without even saying anything? He was angry, but he was going to sin in his anger and do something that was not right. And if overreactions are common, we probably tend to think of how others have overreacted towards us. And usually in a moment when someone acts towards us in a way that's harmful, derogatory, unkind, like we respond in kind. I'm talking in our natural flesh. I'm not talking about walking in the Spirit. And walking in, in faithfulness to Christ-like character. But we respond. And, and so it, we kind of can't even remember where it all started. But it started somewhere. And then someone did something unkind. And we responded unkind. And we create a whirlpool destructive cycle of being unkind and unloving to one another. People that we love. People we care about. Family. But have we also considered that our own actions are possible overreactions to things that we've heard or seen or perceived. You see, we humans, we do have a tendency to judge others by a different standard than we're willing to be judged with. We have a standard, God's Word. And the standard is not how I'm doing with God's Word and my obedience to God's Word and I compare you to me and thinking I'm comparing you to God's Word. But you, between you and God, follow 
God's word. Me, between me and God, follow God's word. And as a family, maybe a household, like an actual husband, wife, children, there's accountability that's appropriate. To encourage one another to walk in faithfulness to God's word. And there's the same thing in a church family, that we have a, a proper responsibility to encourage one another, to hold one another accountable for being faithful to God's word. It's necessary. But God gives a lot of ways and attitudes about how we go about it. If we did judge ourselves by the same standard we used, we probably wouldn't want to be judged that way. The standard should be the truth, the truth of God's word. And I'm going to also say it takes a lot of time and work to get to that truth, to get to the truth. That's what families do. Good, healthy families. Verse 25, when Laban overtook Jacob, Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country and Laban and his relatives also pitched their tents in the hill country of Gilead. Laban said to Jacob, what have you done? You have deceived me and taken my daughters away like prisoners of war? Overreaction. Why did you secretly flee from me, deceive me, and not tell me? I would have sent you away with joy and singing and tambourines and lyres, but you didn't even let me kiss my grandchildren and my daughters. You have acted foolishly. Do you think Laban really would have thrown a party, celebrated, kissed them, and sent them on their way with joy? We don't know. The author of Genesis doesn't tell us. That's what Laban claims to believe. But Jacob did not give him the benefit of the unknown. And now Laban is, I don't know, God said don't say anything good or bad. And this seems a little bit harsh. But he still, here he is. This is what happened. Verse 29, I, I could do you great harm <laughs> if I wanted to. I could crush you. I think, you know, if you're a father-in-law, you kind of know what I'm talking about. I could crush you. If you're a son-in-law, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about too. <laughs> he said, I could do you great harm, but last night the God of your father, ooh, the God of your father said to me, watch yourself. Don't say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Now you have gone off because you long for your father's family. And it's like right there, we could just leave it alone. There it is. It's done. It's settled. I've said my piece. Go in peace, dude. I, I get it. You got to go back to your dad. But there's another phrase. Question. But why have you stolen my God's? Which leads me to a question of, if, if a God is powerful, can they be stolen? But, but Laban goes, okay, the things that you've actually done to wrong me, okay, all right, but why did you take my gods? How wild is it that Laban heard from the Lord God? in a dream, the one true God, but he's concerned with his household idols that represent false, weak, powerless gods. That Paul in the New Testament refers to idols as representing demons. Why do these household idols matter so much to him? Jacob responds, though, in the, into this question in verse 31. Jacob answered, I was afraid. <laughs> That's honesty, isn't it? He was afraid. Fear drove him to do what he did. Jacob answered, I was afraid for I thought you would take your daughters from me by force like you came to do. I mean, he doesn't say that. But I'm saying Laban, I think that's what was part of what was in his mind. I'm, I'm going to take my daughters back by force. I've got my sons, my relatives. These are fighting men that are going to do Jacob harm and take these daughters and grandchildren away from him. What a great honest answer. I was afraid. I thought you would do harm to me, something that I wasn't willing to let go of. And I felt that I'd be powerless to stop it. It was fear. 
that brought Jacob to his overreaction. And so we can have a little grace and understanding for him. That, if I put myself in his shoes, I could see that. I understand. But Jacob continues in verse 32. He says, if you find your gods with anyone here, he will not live. Jacob had no idea Rachel had taken the household gods. And he is willing to say, father-in-law, dad, Laban, look, my, my household is open to you. Search me. Search this. If, you, if there's something, that it, then we will deal with it appropriately and that person will die. And do this, he says, before our relatives point out anything that is yours and, and take it. I'm not, if it's yours, it, it belongs to you. I'm not trying to take anything from you. Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen the idols. It never occurred to him that one of his wives, especially Rachel, his dearly loved wife, might have taken them. And in a, in a sense, he has just spoken a potential death sentence for Rachel. And so Laban went into Jacob's tent, Leah's tent, and the tents of the two concubines, but he found nothing. Another day we might try to understand why there are so many different tents. Or maybe understand that family a little bit better. When he left Leah's tent... He went into Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken Laban's household idols, put them in the saddlebag of the camel and sat on them. Laban searched the whole tent but found nothing. She said to her father, don't be angry, my Lord, for I cannot stand up in your presence. I'm having my period. So Laban searched but could not find the household idols. Rachel is playing a very dangerous game. And Laban, ultimately the outcome here, did not find the household idols. He was, in a sense, rightfully wronged. Like, he is correct that someone had taken something from him that belonged to him. What he's pursuing is a bad thing or not a good thing. What was taken was not a good thing, but he doesn't find it. So after searching multiple tents... And spending, and probably, you know, there's this situation, this time that has gone on. Jacob is watching this situation. He's not seeing Laban finding anything that belongs to Laban. And verse 36 says, then Jacob became incensed. By the way, that's like a really strong word for angry. I mean, like the word in Hebrew means he was glowing hot. You ever seen metal glowing hot? Do you want to touch that metal? I, I hope not. I mean, he was, he was livid, and he gets angry, and somewhat wrongfully so, and yet somewhat rightfully so, and he brought charges against Laban, and he speaks this out to the family. He goes, what is my crime, he said to Laban, what is my sin that you have pursued me? So he, Jacob is innocent. And in, in having taken something from Laban, his wives and his children were his to take. They were his family. They were his responsibility biblically and in all their ways. So he was right and free to do what he did, even if it was ill-advised. He didn't take the idols. His wife did. And he goes, "What, what is my sin that you have pursued me? So sometimes the truth of the lie or the misunderstanding or something that comes out is, is there, but it's, it's totally misunderstood by both parties. Something wrong was done. But both pursued it in the wrong way. And then verse 37, he says, you've searched all my possessions. Have you found anything of yours? And he's saying, if you have, put it here before my relatives and yours. Put it before all these witnesses and let them decide between the two of us. Whatever it is that you found that's yours, you put it here. Let's make this known. That's yours, not mine. What has Laban put out there? Nothing. He didn't find a thing. And he wants to make that matter clear. He wants to settle that matter for his entire and extended family. Verse 38, Jacob continues. He's he's getting on a roll here. He says, I've been with you these 20 years. 
I've been with you 20 years. Did that not count for something? It's kind of where he's going with that. Listen to what he says. Your ewes and female goats have not miscarried. No, don't know that Jacob's entirely responsible for that other than you know, being a good shepherd and making sure they're in good shape and position to give birth to, to baby sheep. But, uh, but still miscarriages happen. Apart, but God has blessed Jacob. And he adds, and I have not eaten the rams from your flock. I haven't taken something that didn't belong to me from you. Verse 39, he says, I did not bring you any of the flock torn by wild beasts. Even though that's not even my fault, he's saying. He says, I myself bore the loss. You, Laban, you demanded payment from me for what was stolen by day or by night. And rightfully so, in a sense, because Jacob was the one responsible for keeping the sheep. And if it got stolen, it was his responsibility. And he said, he did all these things. Verse 40, there I was, out working for you, Laban. The heat consumed me by day, and the frost by night, and sleep fled from my eyes. It has cost me something to work for you, Laban. I have sacrificed for you. I have eaten the loss. I've taken it personally. And for 20 years in your household, I served you. 14 years for your two daughters. Six years for your flocks. And you've changed my wages 10 times. If anyone is in the wrong, it's not me is what he's implying. And verse 42, but he doesn't say that. He just says, if the God of my father, the God of Abraham, the fear of Isaac. Interesting how Jacob understands his dad, his dad's fear of God, the Lord Almighty. But if it hadn't been for the God of my father, the God of Abraham, the fear of Isaac, if he had not been with me, certainly now you would have sent me off empty-handed. If you'd have had your way, Laban, coming after me, overtaking me, you you would have taken everything from me if it hadn't been for my God speaking to you. I don't have this in one of the notes, but you might add, God is the one who changes hearts. When it comes to misunderstanding, be in prayer that God changes hearts. doesn't mean we don't have conversations. It just means we pray still for God to change hearts. But in, he finishes the sentence, but God has seen my affliction and my hard work, and he issued his verdict last night. Jacob understands that the most important person to please is God Almighty. And that we, if we are right before God Almighty, that is the one we have to please the most. Jacob recalls his honest labor and his dealings with Laban, and he credits God for protection from Laban's dishonorable action here, and he refers to God of his father Abraham, the God of Isaac, the fear of Isaac. And let me just point this out. This is our fourth point. In a family, self-centered attitudes lead to strife. What we're seeing is self-centered attitudes that lead to actions that hurt that didn't take others into consideration. It led to great strife. There were misunderstandings, there were overreactions, followed by reactions to the overreactions, and and the destructive whirlpool cycle had begun in their relationship. And and at least three different characters in the text so far have contributed to the strife in this account. Rachel contributed when she stole her father's household idols. That was a self-centered attitude and action and Laban in cheating Jacob 10 times in, in his 20 years with him and then planning to harm Jacob by coming to overtake him and probably steal his daughters and, and grandchildren away from Jacob. He is also self-centered in his action and in his mindset toward Jacob. And Jacob also was self-centered and, and leaning into fear when he left without communication and in also getting glowing hot against Laban the way that he did, but yet he turns and says, God is the judge. But all of these have expressed self-centered attitudes of some kind, and look how it contributed to some real strife. But it's not the end. I want to comment now to just say that our, in the New Testament, after Christ, those that are in Christ are, are given the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. He, he adopts us and calls us His children. So... He begins the process of sanctification. As he makes us the new creation, he declares in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. But yet there's also this balance, a struggle within us because the old flesh that is supposed to be crucified with Christ, yet nevertheless we live, but Christ in us, it still has to be put to death every day. 
And sometimes we go back to that old nature and we resurrect it. Romans 12, 1 and 2, the, what you present your body is a living sacrifice. That's the problem with living sacrifices. They like to run away from the knife and the fire. And so we have to daily put our flesh to death. That is because uh, our fleshly nature is what is the tendency to put self first. Our new creation, our in Christ character is to put Christ first. It is to glorify God, even at our own expense. Do you understand when we walk in the flesh with a self-centered spirit, we will cause more strife than peace? Verse 43, then Laban answered Jacob, the daughters are my daughters. The children, my children. And the flocks, my flocks. Everything you see is mine. What? No. He's wrong. But that's his perception. That's his misunderstanding. But, but he says, but he resolves. But what can I do today for these daughters of mine or for the children they have born? And so he comes to this place of let's make an agreement. Verse 44, come now. Let's make a covenant. You and I, let it be a witness between the two of us. And you see Laban's misunderstanding, perceiving that all that Jacob has, including his wives and children belonging to him, it will certainly taint the way he approaches Jacob. And Laban proposes a covenant that seems to be headed to a place of resolution, which is a good thing. Verse 45, so Jacob picked out a stone and set it up as a marker. Then Jacob said to his relatives, all the extended family here, gather stones. And they took stones and they made a mound and then ate there by the mound. It's always good to come together and eat. And Laban, verse 47, Laban named the mound Jagar Sehadutha, which translated means the heap of witness or testimony. But Jacob named it Galid, which means hill of witness or testimony. Did you catch that? They still aren't in agreement. Hey, we're going to make a mound of rocks and make an agreement. Okay, Laban goes, I'm going to name it a heap of witness. Jacob goes, "Mm, I'm going to name it a hill of witness. Then Laban said, the mound is a witness between you and me today. Therefore, the place was called Galid and also Mizpah, something else altogether. For he said, may the Lord watch between you and me when we are out of each other's sight. By the way, Mizpah means watchtower, pile of rocks. Let it be the place where God watches and and sees you and sees me. Okay, this is a good place to begin on on resolution. Let us surrender our opinions, our rights, our thoughts to the one who sees it all, the one who knows the truth. And then he says, Laban continues in this agreement, he says, if you mistreat my daughters or take other wives, which I think is a way of mistreating his daughters in his mind, he says, though no one is with us, So he's like, even though I may not see it or anybody else of my family may see it, understand that God will be a witness between you and me. And Laban also said to Jacob, look at this mound and the marker I've set up between you and me. This mound, (laughs) it's funny, Laban set that up. I thought Jacob said grab the, anyway. Uh, But it's his mound. This mound, verse 52, is a witness and the marker is a witness that I will not pass beyond this mound to you and you will not pass beyond this mound and this marker to do me wrong harm. The God of Abraham, the gods of Nahor, Nahor, by the way, was the granddad of Abram, great granddad of Laban. The gods of their father, plural, lowercase, false gods, reference there, will judge between us. That's what Laban is saying. The God of Abraham, I know he serves a pretty powerful God, He's going to judge, and, the, and, the judge uh, and then the gods of our, our grandfathers, 
They're going to judge. All of those will judge. They're going to see it, and they're going to deal with you accordingly. And, and so there's this mound between us. And if you cross it to, with any intent to do me harm, they're going to see it and be a judge. And I think he implies that he won't come across it to do harm to Jacob too, but he doesn't really explicitly say that. It's, you know, sometimes when we make an agreement, we don't always get exactly what we want to hear. But they are seeking peace between them, which is a good thing. Jacob agrees to the covenant by swearing on only the fear of his father Isaac. Did you see that? Uh, after he said the gods of their father will judge between us, and Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac, he doesn't mention the gods of Nahor. He knows the one who truly sees. Verse 54 and 55, then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain and invited his relatives to eat a meal. So they ate a meal and spent the night on the mountain. They made peace. Let's have dinner. There's peace. Verse 55 tells us Laban got up early in the morning, kissed his grandchildren and daughters, and blessed them. Then Laban left to return home. A sacrifice here reveals a solemn attitude toward the vow that was made and an understanding that God does truly see and that we are under Him. And as they ate together, even though they were angry with each other just a little bit before, they've set that aside and agreed to not harm each other, to, to get along as family. He, and, and, and so he was able to kiss his grandkids and his daughters and bless them. Now you notice Jacob is excluded from getting a kiss from dear old dad. But he's at peace. So I don't think Laban left liking Jacob, but he was at peace with Jacob. And I want you to know, in a family, number five, peace is achievable with two willing parties. It takes two willing parties. There's a resolve that both parties would not harm each other. They set up a mound of rocks as a reminder. And they made this agreement. This is a covenant. This is a big deal. You break the covenant, you get broken, is the kind of language, the kind of idea. Like this is a matter that cannot be broken, should not ever be broken, should not even be thought of to be broken. So we're going to honor this deal. But both parties had to be willing. Both parties felt wronged. But they came to the table. Rachel had stolen her dad's household idols. Jacob had left without communication and without a farewell to the family. And Jacob had been wronged by Laban and cheated and tricked and mistreated. And both had to release the charges. They had to forgive each other of charges that they rightfully had against the other. They released it. And they both had to think of their self less. To put what was important ahead of them, peace and unity after which they were able to eat together and have a cordial parting. Grandpa was able to kiss his babies, his grandbabies. And Laban, though mentioned again in Scripture, is no longer a part of the main storyline. We don't see him interact yet again. And they probably weren't close after this time. I don't know if they ever made a visit back home, but they were at peace. And it's kind of a sad part of the story of Jacob. And today, we can learn so much from that family. And we can learn that for our own families. And we can learn about, as a church family, how we should interact and how we should understand when there's strained relationships in our family. The the New Testament uses some amazing language about our identity in Christ, such as we're the bride of Christ, speaking of the whole church. And that we have been adopted into His family as children of God, undeserving children but adopted made valued by him and that means as children of God that have been adopted into the family the exact same way by God's grace through faith we are brothers and sisters in a family and I can tell you that these things are true in a church family too these points that I've discussed today misunderstandings are easy and abundant. We need to be aware of that and follow God's word. One of the things that God's word tells us is to be quick to listen, 
slow to speak, slow to anger. We, we jump right over that quick to listen part. It's not just hearing the words come out of their mouth. It's, it's hearing to understand. And maybe when we understand, we might not be so quick to have something to say. And if we understand, we might not be so quick to get angry. Because if our anger and our, our speaking in response to what we understood was false, if we didn't listen very well, then we've created a problem that didn't need to be. And, and make sure, brothers and sisters, pastor, let's make sure that what we are producing is a fruit of the Spirit. And if we find ourselves ap operating, acting in the flesh, slow down, pump the brakes. Let's, let's get back to abiding in the vine and, and seek the Spirit to fill us with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Let us clothe ourselves with the attitude of humility that Christ took on himself. We see in Philippians chapter 2, we honor others as more important than ourselves. That might mean we do hard things, like have hard conversations with the person that we're upset with. Misunderstandings, brothers and sisters, friends who I love, they, they are a satanic tactic that has been effective for millennia. It dividing God's people, the children of God, adopted children of God have divided because Satan worked a misunderstanding in. And recently, there have been some misunderstandings in our church. And yet, only a few have spoken with me to understand accurately. Overreactions are common. They're so common. And most of the time, I don't even think we realize that we're overreacting. So guard against these emotional actions and reactions. Because remember, overreactions tend not to produce or bear the fruit of the Spirit. And I understand I'm very compassionate, I'm very gracious, knowing that there are things, when you have a misunderstanding and you believe that to be true, and it's really bad, like I get why you're feeling the way you're feeling. But if it's not the truth, I don't want you to keep feeling the way you're feeling. I want to remind you, self-centered attitudes and actions cause more strife, not less. Christ-centered attitudes and actions are what are necessary. And as Christ followers, we need to be Christ-centered with our attitudes and our actions. Amen. Trusting His revealed Word. Trusting His Spirit within us. So let me encourage you to take your time to evaluate your decisions and your feelings. And if self is at the center, it's probably time for realignment. As a brother and sister in Christ, that's not the end of the world to realign. To be where you need to be with the Lord, with your brothers and sisters. And it doesn't matter what the strain is, what the difficulty is, what the disagreement is. These apply in all those situations. And understand, we might have differences on doctrines that are not essential to salvation. We, we might have a conviction about it, thinking that this really matters. And indeed, wonderful, there are important matters that are non-essential. They are important, but they're non-essential. And we should understand that even if we have a conviction about it, there, there should be freedom for one another to grow in our understanding. Amen. Freedom and grace where we might land on differing convictions for a time. Maybe we come together in years. That's what a family will do. We'll be patient. We'll love one another. We'll bring each other along. And I want you to know that I refuse to force a conviction of non-essential matters on anyone else. And unity is possible, even with imperfect relationships. It's possible, and I want you to know I'm willing. There should be grace. There should be grace. But be cautious about demanding perfection from others, or even me, unless we're calling us to the standard of God's Word. Are we loving each other with Christ-like love? 
That is our goal. Scripture tells us love is patient, love is kind. Love believes all things. That's the nature of the heart. We believe the goodwill even when you don't see it in the action. We give room to understand differently than we perceived. That's love. Love endures all things. It means we're going to go through some stuff and some hard conversations sometimes that are, we're going to feel like, man, I'm, it's uncomfortable. I want to get out of that. But what God is producing is growth in us. We don't grow much when we're not under pressure. I've watched my kids grow rapidly, physically in size, and I watch them ache with pains in their knees and in their joints because they grow so fast. And sometimes God is growing us and we don't know it. We're uncomfortable. Don't rush it. Don't seek relief immediately just for the sake of relief, but seek the Lord and let him grow you. Let him grow me. Because he's good and he's faithful at completing what he started in us, his children. Finally, peaceful agreement remains possible with two willing parties. I'm willing. Let's be willing to seek peace with each other. Let us be the kind of church that has unity in Christ. On what is clear in his word. And where there's disagreement, let us love one another and give freedom. Let's have much grace for each other, even through misunderstandings and overreactions. And I, it's a weird message if you're not a member of the church, you're a guest that might be like, whoa, what is going on? But I'm also speaking directly to you because I want you to know the kind of church that I believe we should be. A family, a family that has good, necessary conversations that seek unity together. And I also want you to know you can have peace with God. If you're not a Christ follower, you've never put your faith in him for the forgiveness of your sins, for eternal life, he's calling you today. Trust him. He is the one who sees all. He is the one that provided salvation through Christ. Trust him. And then you begin a long journey of walking with him where you're imperfect like Jacob was imperfect. And if you are a member of this church, just remember we're imperfect people. God is writing still the most beautiful story of redemption, not just back in these pages, but in the pages of history that are today of rescuing people. It is such a joy to watch someone put their faith in Christ. But it's also such a joy to see a disciple become a disciple. Someone who gets excited about knowing God and walking with God for life. It's not about just making a convert who says, I prayed a prayer, but then never knows Jesus. We want to make disciples. That's the command of the Great Commission. Will you join me, brothers and sisters, in honoring God's word and living for him? Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. I ask for your help as we come to a time of response to your word. It's difficult to know what exactly to ask, Lord. But I ask that you would bring a unity here that can only have been accomplished by your spirit. And bring peace and joy among our family here. Grow us up into maturity. Grow us up into finding the thrill of proclaiming the gospel and seeing some reject, yes, but others putting their faith in Christ. May we be faithful to you, Father. May we put self aside and honor you. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.